Uh, my name is Clayton Duby. I'm with the U.S.-China Institute, and today we have a wonderful presentation that's going to introduce uh, 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 one of the sharpest uh, analysts of contemporary China, somebody who's well known in this field, who has a terrific new book out. Dr. Chung uh, was educated in Shanghai at East China Normal University. He went to school at Berkeley, got his PhD at Princeton. He subsequently became a professor of political science and taught for many years at Hamilton College. He's been connected to Brookings since 2005 and has directed the John L. Thornton China Center there since 2014. Now, I first became aware of Professor, Ch Professor Lee's work with this book, uh, with Rediscovering China, uh, which he published in 1997. This is a terrific book and came out of two years of fellowship-supported fieldwork in Shanghai and elsewhere in China. In this book, it's called Rediscovering China because Dr. Li was returning to China after a long time away. He opens the book by talking about his own, his own family's horrific experiences during the Cultural Revolution, and then through interviews, through case studies, survey data, explores how China was changing at that stage in the reform process. Uh, throughout the book, when he inter introduces us to rural industrialists, to urban entrepreneurs, all of this sort of thing, he is looking at how these changes in China could impact not just China, but the US-China relationship. Well, fast forward 24 years, and that's where he's at again with this book on China's middle class. Now, in between, he published another book on China's emerging middle class, but became especially well-known for his attention to China's political elite, looking at factions, looking at power maneuvering, uh, exploring the role of Mishu, of these secretaries, discussing uh, how collective leadership was likely to fare under Xi Jinping. Somehow, he also found time to map the tobacco industry in China. So his interests have been really quite wide. Uh, one of those books about uh, China's elite is this one about China's leaders. Nobody knows this subject the way that Cheng Li does. And so we are especially happy to have us with us with uh, have him with us today. He brings a lot of diverse research to bear in looking at middle-class Shanghai. One of the questions we have is, does it make sense to talk about a middle class? Why be so preoccupied with the middle class? Who's included? Who are these people? What do they think? What do they want? What difference might they make? We get a great picture of these things from this book. But it's really a fascinating study. It opens with a description, discussion of this incredible uh, yet disintegrating artwork, a sand structure replica of the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank building on the Shanghai Bund. And it closes with a discussion about avant-garde art and what it has to say about the middle class, about China today. In between, there's a lot on economic change. There's quite a lot also on the political ramifications of this. There's special attention on, uh, uh, paid to all of the returnees to China, specifically to Shanghai, from other places, including the United States. Friends, it's wonderful that you're with us today, and it's our great pleasure and honor to bring you Dr. Chung Lee. Chung, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Craig, for that uh, overly generous introduction. I would like to share with you three main um, aspects of the book, namely, number one, thesis and the methodology. Number two, debates and the developments. Uh, within China uh, on the subject. And finally, 
anecdotes and uh, artwork, as you mentioned, that uh, my uh, book started with uh, uh, some discussion about uh, uh, avant-garde art, but also ended with two chapters on that uh, the subject. Now, um, uh, certainly that um, the book, uh, the third part actually, uh, consists of the more lively human stories and the visual images, which serve to balance the large amount of empirical data in the early uh, part of my presentation, including uh, the book has uh, 50 charts and the tables in this almost a 500 page long book. So I want to uh, not just uh, you know, make you so bored about the, the statistics, but with a combination of these things. Now, the first, the book certainly, the, the thesis certainly runs contrary to prevailing views uh, in, in Washington, D.C. and uh, about the failure of U.S. engagement policy toward China. This is also, to a certain extent, also in the entire country. Now, there are several components I particularly want to challenge. One is the viewing China as a monolithic entity uh, with no distinction between state and society, uh, the so-called whole of society threat, certainly that um, Nothing is really monolithic when you come to the most populous country in the world. Even I will argue, Shanghai itself is, a mon is not monolithic either. Now, also, secondly, uh, the, 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 the tendency to view the middle class as a political ally of the party state uh, without recognizing the, dyna uh, the dynamic uh, dynamism and the diversity of this new socioeconomic force and its uh, possible transitory political role. And finally, uh, I want to criticize uh, the views that, uh, you know, seeing the largest uh, number of the PRC students and the scholars in the US as the spies being weaponized. This is a term frequently we see in the media or by some politicians, uh, the uh, students, Chinese students as a weapon or weaponized by Beijing and therefore assuming bilateral educational exchanges benefit only China and may even undermine American supremacy and American security. Now, these are the things I wanted to challenge. Now, the central question and the central argument I wanted to highlight, uh, the, the central question is, if American, um, you know, uh, America disengaged from the forces of the Chinese society, it's especially, especially it's a dynamic middle class, and what leverage and inference can the United States have on China's future evolution? Uh, this is so-called soft power inference. Uh, certainly we undermine um, uh, uh, such a, 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 a inference and the leverage uh, with the recent uh, you know, uh, the deterioration of US-China relations start with uh, uh, President Donald Trump's final you know, a couple of years. Now the central argument of the, of the book is as the world's two major powers, each with a large middle class population, neither China nor the United States has the interest or the capacity to destroy the other. This is also the argument uh, uh, made by uh, many uh, American scholars or political leaders such as Dr. Henry Kissinger. So certainly I belong to that group. Maybe it's a minority at the moment. Now, both countries, China and the United States, therefore need to find an entirely new way to coexist by reshaping US-China engagement. Now, the, uh, uh, here's the methodology uh, in terms of the both research methods and also range uh, of the focus. Now, I adopt a number of uh, different methodologies like a statistic analysis, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's 50 charts or tables, a lot of data. Uh, some are uh, original, some are uh, secondary. And also uh, that uh, as uh, Craig mentioned earlier that uh, I spend uh, the most of my career research on Chinese elites and including um, the Shanghai elites are very, very important Chinese political leaders. And uh, um, I think that they will become increasingly so in the years to come. Uh, there's one chapter in the book is about uh, Shanghai uh, political leaders. Now also that the political and the cultural discourse by Chinese intellectuals, public intellectuals and the scholars. And also there's a survey uh, conducted several surveys actually 
conducted by uh, Verizon company and uh, a leading survey company in China and uh, conducted in two different years and also compare these, uh, these surveys with, with other surveys conducted by other scholars, uh, uh, Chinese or foreign. And uh, my surveys, two surveys, uh, I concentrate on foreign educated retainees, the so-called sea turtles because the pronunciation of foreign educated retainees and uh, sea turtles that uh, have the same pronunciation. Now, finally, it's the content analysis of the artwork. So the book has a, uh, about uh, 16 uh, art plates uh, representing uh, the Shanghai avant-garde artists. Particularly, I focus on five artists. Now, the income range of the uh, focus uh, that include architecture and urban landscape and uh, municipal government, high education in terms of both the professors and the college administrators, and also the impact on various aspects of higher education. And there's a discussion about the legal profession emergence of the, those who study law, uh, whether it be in China or in foreign countries, including United States, Germany, Japan, UK, and like, Singapore, and et cetera. Uh, these people uh, actually uh, play a very, very important role in China's legal uh, profession. And the early on, the Ford Foundation, Henry Roos Foundation, and many other US foundations contribute to the emergence or the early development of the legal profession and legal development. And finally, it's avant-garde artists. Now, why Shanghai? Um, uh, now, um, understanding Shanghai is vital to understanding modern China. I actually had a quote, a bit Chinese saying, goes like that, to learn about the 2000 year Chinese history, we should, should visit Xi'an. To understand the 500 year Middle Kingdom, one has to see Beijing to grasp the past 100 years of change in China, we must look at Shanghai. Now also that uh, in 1953, a distinguished American historian, Rose Murphy, a uh, professor at the Michigan at that time, he wrote a book, the title is Shanghai, Key to Modern China. So we, we cannot underestimate uh, the role that Shanghai plays in the past uh, century or so. Now, Shanghai is also cradle of both the middle class and the foreign educated retainees, the two, group, two groups I you know, focus in this study, in this book. And also I'm particularly intrigued, intrigued by Shanghai's um, culture, multiple cultural identities, and uh, um, namely local, national, and the cosmopolitan. They are all dynamic, mutually reinforce each other, which also, uh, retaining independent value within particular context. Shanghai's uh, cultural dynamics stress neither cultural clash nor cultural convergence, but rather cultural coexistence and the cultural diversity. Now, this is a, a, a very important argument uh, that um, our finding that uh, I want to highlight in this study. Now, and finally, that um, uh, uh, Shanghai is currently the pace setter in China's new search for global power. And its role will shape how China will act and how the outside world will respond to the emergence of a so-called a global China. So that's the, the reason why I choose Shanghai. Besides that, uh, that also Shanghai is my hometown and uh, uh, my first book also concentrate uh, as a Clay mentioned that I concentrated Shanghai in 1990, uh, middle 1990s when I was a fellow with uh, spent two years. So it's a story about uh, like my Ripovenko experience to see the emergence of the middle class at that time. Now, but Shanghai is also full of contradiction. You know, uh, I mentioned that I used the, uh, the, the uh, this title, the two tales of city uh, in an opinion piece just published a few weeks ago talk about Shanghai's contradictions, Shanghai's paradoxes. Now this is referred to uh, history, present and the future. Now, as we know in historically, Shanghai is the, uh, is the most westernized Chinese city. There's no dispute about that. But also Shanghai is the birthplace of the Chinese Communist Party. Of course, one can argue that the Communist Party is also uh, is from, uh, foreign, from the West. And also China, uh, Shanghai was the center uh, at least one of the centers of a Maoist uh, radicalism 
during the Cultural Revolution. I grew up at that time. Now, presently, uh, Shanghai is a frontier city of market reforms, opening up at cosmopolitanism, the, all these positive things. But at the same time, uh, the Chinese leaders of pub, uh, public talk about Shanghai and refer to Shanghai as the head of dragon, uh, which could be interpreted as China's industrial policy or even state capitalism. And uh, in contrast to Shenzhen, which is uh, or Zhejiang province, there's a lot of private uh, companies. Shanghai actually is dominated by state-owned enterprises, uh, in particular in cutting edge uh, research like uh, aerospace and um, um, you know, AI and many others. These are, uh, many of them are state firms. So you can see another contradiction in that. Now refer to the future. Shanghai has been seen or called as the vanguard of the middle class worldly voices, views, and values, which are similar to their peers uh, in other countries. But at the same time, Shanghai is also a showcase of China's growing mercantilist global outreach. Uh, could be seen as a threat. Shanghai, in that regard, it's also a uh, play uh, important role. Now, so again, it's in Shanghai itself is a uh, full of contradictions. Now, let me uh, go very quickly to the, uh, the some of the debate. I will not go each and of them. With, uh, this, uh, there's uh, several five things uh, I um, you know use two chapters to. Uh, document the, these uh, debates, especially um, within Chinese inter, uh, intellectual communities in terms of definition and the composition of the middle class and the total number and the future expansion. Uh, there's some different views about the middle class expansion in the coming years, particularly um, you know, after COVID-19. You see some of the uh, decline in some countries in the middle class uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of expansion. But uh, in China, it's, uh, it's still controversial. Some people argue that the middle class actually expand uh, rather than reduce. Now, also talk about social certification and the group consciousness, how to make that um, very diverse group in, in a way it's also coherent in terms of its core values. That's the next one, the internal cohesion and the shared values I will explain just in a few minutes. And also uh, finally, uh, it's very, very important for many people in China and outside the world. It's a political role and the middle class relation with the, the China's party state. Now, uh, in terms of rapid expansion of the China's middle class, I mean, this is uh, uh, just tremendous data to support uh, uh, that, um, that the expansion of the middle class. By uh, two years ago, I mean, by 2019, 40 years after China began its economic reform and opening up uh, the GDP and uh, had grown 60 times large and the per capita income 25 times large. This is one of the miracles, maybe the, the most impressive miracle in terms of economic growth in any country in uh, modern history. Now GDP uh, per capita has increased from about 1,000 US dollars uh, 20 years ago in 2001 to 10,000 or 10,500 US dollars last year. And uh, uh, based on the Lianghui uh, this year in March, uh, Chinese government plan, uh, you know, uh, plan to uh, have the goal to reach thirty thousand US dollars by twenty thirty five. Now in Shanghai per uh, per GDP capita already per capita already exceeds twenty three thousand US dollars in twenty twenty last year. So it's really quite uh, impressive. Now in twenty eighteen, five million registered households in Shanghai were regarded as the middle class families. This is a, a constitute 91% of the total registered families. I emphasize registered households. This is the not, uh, the not include migrants and their families. For them, uh, uh, certainly you see the economic disparity, uh, the tensions, but the, uh, uh, local, uh, for the local residents, registered residents is quite remarkable. A majority of them, overwhelming majority of them belong to the middle class. Now also in 2019, the average value of the registered household assets in Shanghai was eight, uh, eight, uh, you know, point one million yuan, about one point two million, based on report by the People's Bank of China. So that's the uh, quite remarkable uh, development. Now, uh, these are the I will not go into details in terms of the urban uh, the, uh, the the savings uh, disposable income of the urban residents of Shanghai. Uh, look at the past uh, forty years. And, but also interesting, this is based on the study 
by McKinsey, uh, especially by Dominic Barton, now the, uh, the ambassador, uh, Canadian ambassador to China. Uh, he was the head of McKinsey. Uh, he and his colleague wrote the report. In 2002, 40% of China's middle class live in four cities, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. But uh, according to this study, next year, 2022, uh, the percentage will drop to 16%. At the same time, uh, those middle class percentage middle class uh, in China, uh, uh, you know, from living in the other cities, sixty percent of them live in other cities, will increase to eighty four percent the total total middle class in the country. That including forty five percent in the tier two city and even thirty one percent in tier three cities. You can see the middle class expand from the coastal region, major cities to inland cities, and etc. And then in terms of coastal versus inland. Also, from the 87% in coast region uh, reduced to 61%, and the inland region from 13% uh, increased to 39%. So that's a remarkable uh, uh, demographical distribution change. And uh, uh, now, of course, the middle class, um, in terms of their occupation, it's a quite heterogeneous, not a homogeneous. That includes three clusters, economic cluster, political cluster, and the cultural education clusters. So I don't want to go to detail because of time concern. So it's really diverse a lot, uh, including government officials. But I, I also meant, want to mention the middle class in Western countries also divided by uh, different subgroups. This is not uniquely uh, uh, Chinese. Now, so if they're so different, you see some of the values may, be, may not be the same, but I still argue that the, the uh, there's, there's some shared middle class values or attitudes. Uh, I list uh, here like the, you know, um, eight or nine. One is appreciate the middle class lifestyle, protect the property, pro private property rights, support policies that promote education, more or less shared by middle class, advocate for measures that safeguard the environment, care deeply about food and drug safety, resent the government's great firewall online, now, even those officials, they are sometimes very critical about this lack, uh, you know, lack of uh, information and uh, uh, the, the media censorship and uh, whether it be WeChat, whether it be, uh, you know, all the social medias and et cetera. Uh, and also demand government accountability and the transparency and uh, look favorably towards economic globalization. That differ from many middle class in the Western countries because uh, in the United States, according to some uh, 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 studies that since 1980s, uh, only top 20% of income group uh, benefit from economic liberalization. Uh, the other, you know, 80%, you know, um, the the interest uh, income group, uh, including middle class, did not benefit that much. Or even um, uh, you see the shrinking of the middle class. That explains some of people voted for President Donald Trump or complained. Uh, they're still very critical about. Uh, about the, uh, the, you know, uh, sounds like a Chinese uh, eat, uh, you know, our lunch and etc. Right. So that's explained. But in China, most of people benefit, and also a lot of people got rid of poverty. So that's explained the positive view about Chinese middle class about economic liberalization. Uh, finally, naturally, as Chinese, and uh, they hold pride for China's rise on the world stage. Now. But uh, um, there's a political roles. I do not, because of time concern, I could not um, um, uh, go to details, but certainly I put the literature um, uh, into a debate from Western scholars who argue there's a coalition between rise of middle class and the political system or civil society. And I still think that uh, uh, the, there's some truism, although maybe it's too early. My point is that still uh, middle class, rise of middle class in China is relative phenomenon, new phenomenon, and it's just too uh, premature to announce that the middle classes will only support authoritarian regime and anti-democracy. I think it's far from uh, clear to me. Now, the middle class stratum, of course, is, uh, uh, is a balancing and a stabilizing force in almost all societies. So China is not an exception. Actually, Mengzi, you know, Manchus said 2,000 years ago that uh, you know, those who have property are also inclined to preserve social stability. Uh, that's probably uh, explained. They uh, emphasize status quo. And, uh, but uh, this is going to be a transitory phase. It all depends. And, uh, and also Chinese middle class favors 
social uh, economic, uh, social political stability has a specific reason, given many are familiar with the two major events in the 1990s, when is Japan's last decade of economic growth and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Certainly Chinese propaganda machines argue this is part of American conspiracy and many Chinese uh, probably buy that argument or that perception. Now, of course, there are some people who have some reservations, obviously. Now, also in recent years, middle class uh, protests and the movements constitute the most important political changes to authorities, not from rural area, and uh, 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 um, not from necessarily from dissidents, but from middle class uh, constitute the greatest threat. Now I will show another slide just in a uh, uh, few seconds. And uh, my point is their role was, is, and will be influenced and constrained by situational factors, both domestic and environment and international. Now these are the uh, four major protests over the past few years, uh, including uh, the environment uh, protest, you know, the, the famous uh, video under the dome by uh, Cai Jing, you know, really uh, generated a lot of concern for environment. You know, uh, this is talk about the, uh, you know, uh, several hundred million watchers, viewers. There's also collapse of the online P2P, uh, particularly in major cities like Shanghai, uh, caused a tremendous uh, political uh, challenge and also uh, uh, vaccine or medicine uh, safety. Uh, it, it was a major issue 2018. Now, finally, Dr. Li Wenliang's case, uh, you know, in the early months of the COVID-19, particularly in February, uh, that certainly uh, you should, middle class certainly uh, supported Dr. Li Wenliang and re revealed the middle class outrage at the Dr. Li's mistreatment by, um, at least by uh, local government. So these are all shows that uh, you know, there's a different dimensions, different explanation about the political role of the middle class. Now, finally, that I also want to mention about uh, the returnees, the uh, education exchanges. China experienced the largest uh, foreign study movement in contemporary China, probably in world history. This is uh, the blue light is the number of students overseas and the orange is the number of returnees. They're both increased, um, particularly in recent decade. And also this is the, the rapid growth of the PRC students studying in the United States uh, is really uh, quite remarkable, particularly in the, again, the recent decade. Of course, that uh, the number will drop, partly because of COVID-19, partly because of US policy, you know, as I mentioned, the weaponized, weaponized by Chinese government and a lot of restraints, so probably will be dropped. We still do not have the number yet. Uh, now, uh, currently, China has the largest uh, you know, uh, foreign student body, and 33%. And um, uh, the number two country is India, it's only 18%. So uh, that shows a tremendous impact, uh, uh, you know, in terms of education exchange between China and United States, particularly Chinese students uh, in the in United States. Now, but of course that uh, uh, people argue there's some uh, uh, strong nationalism or even anti-Americanism among the Chinese students, including the Chinese. So I don't want to go detail, but when you put it yourself on the Chinese students' shoes, when you see some of the politicians claim that Beijing is weaponized Chinese students in, at the American universities, and there's a policy, particularly Donald Trump and the Trump administration target the Chinese and Chinese American scientists, this kind of racial profiling still not completed over yet. And also con consider, um, you know, uh, in October, 2018, to terminate the US-China education exchanges and uh, uh, President uh, Trump's uh, uh, rhetoric about Chinese virus or Gong flu, and uh, provoke the xenophobia and anti-Asian hate crimes in the United States, and also some reference, con uh, reference to the uh, conflict between US China as the clash of civilization, and also uh, restraining members of the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, and their families, about 300 million people, in if you include their families, from visiting the United States. You know, if we from these things, you do see that certain give ammunition for the Chinese Communist Party to criticize the United States. And uh, this also explains uh, some of the anti-American sentiment that is on the rapid rise. Now, plus that um, unfortunately, Republican Senator, you know, uh, here I quoted that, that the talk about China has a 5,000 year history of cheating and stealing some things will never change. So what's the impact? What's the implication? If you are Chinese students, how will you look at this? 
Now, finally, I, mean, I, I have more optimistic things about the anecdotes and the artwork. Oh, this is actually the, 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 uh, the, the Starbucks store in Shanghai. Um, let me also mention that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the book that uh, Clay mentioned that I live in China in 1993 to 95, observed glassroots changes. I made some friends. Um, one friend is uh, Australian and um, she and her husband also work for a coffee company want to promote coffee. I, I remember in 1995, they, I had a dinner with them. I still remember vividly. I wrote because I wrote a report on that. They told me there's no market whatsoever uh, for Chinese. Chinese love teas. They will never change their habit. But that was 1993. I wrote that. I also uh, uh, wrote that as one uh, a friend, a rich entrepreneur, he asked me, what's cappuccino? He never had a cappuccino. So I wrote a report, then an uh, uh, alumni at the Hamilton College, at the time I taught at Hamilton College, he, he is the, his father is the Mr. Coffee, the French owner of the Mr. Coffee. He sent a, a cappuccino machine and asked me to uh, for, uh, you know, pass that to that gentleman, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, businessman. So that was 1995. That is now the largest shop. Uh, uh, in outside United States. This is the sum of the scene that openings, the huge market. Right. Now, um, also that uh, my book also talk about the, um, the, the enduring you know, impact about the people to people diplomacy, public diplomacy, and um, uh, including sports. Uh, you know, tragic deaths of Kirby Bryant occur uh, on January 26 or 27 at uh, the Chinese time. But uh, that was also peak time of the COVID-19 in China. But uh, the Weibo search, um, that um, uh, the search for Kirby and the uh, airplane crash, you know, it's a, it's, I think it's a 1 billion hit, uh, two times more than search on COVID-19. Chinese really want to mourn this uh, hero and uh, his influence so it goes beyond basketball. So that's a uh, really quite a moving uh, story itself. Now also, I, uh, the, the book mentioned about the, some distinguished Shanghainese, uh, including new Shanghainese, and uh, they immigrate to, to Shanghai. So this is uh, the story about the Jingxing, and um, uh, uh, Jingxing show, uh, which is well known in China, uh, but less so outside the, the country. Uh, the Jingxing Show was the highest rated late night show, talk show in China from 2015 to 2017. The host is a transgender woman and uh, a new Shanghainese, an ethnic Korean, and a returnee from the United States. The recurrent theme of this Shanghai based show was the introduction of Western ideas, social norms, progressive values, and the middle class lifestyle uh, trends to the Chinese public. Now, Early this year, uh, that uh, Jingxing took on a new role running Parliament, a famous historical nightclub and the dance hall in Shanghai, uh, Bai Le Men, with a commitment to revitalize the, uh, this cultural uh, hub. Now, this anecdote and many others in the book reflect a high tolerance for different styles and approaches through, Shang, uh, through Shanghai's Hai Pai culture, uh, Shanghainese culture whether in the domain of art, architecture, and um, literature, music, or the public discourse. Now, finally, I want to special, uh, mention one artist. His name is Ding, uh, Ding Yi, Shanghai artist, one of the most famous avant-garde artists in Shanghai. For over three decades, since 1988, Ding Yi has constantly uh, indulging in the creation of a series of painting Experiment entitled uh, titled "Appearances of Appearance of Classes," in which he used addition, uh, addition sign and the multiple multiplication sign. His art is uh, similar to the Chinese traditional, you know, gezibu Chinese uh, plate fabric. Interestingly, uh, the things design uh, were later adopted by the luxury fashion brand uh, Hermes, uh, Ai Ma Si. Uh, to create dozens of scarves. So in a way, Ding Yi's signature 
appearance of classes is an artistic fusion between tradition and modernity, East and West, and abstract and, and uh, utility. Now, more recently, Ding Yi has been trying to extend his unique appearance of classes, painting to three-dimensional media, such as installation, sculpture, architecture, and more. Now, this one certainly was exist, uh, existed uh, you know, almost 10 years ago um, uh, outside of the uh, uh, Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. And also another one uh, in Qingpu, uh, uh, Shanghai. Now that one conveyed the message uh, along with the previous one that uh, when traditional image are enlarged multiple times, their meanings and impressions can change completely. Now, for Ding Yi, it is not just the West that should develop a more updated and balanced assessment uh, of China's ongoing transformation, which is of course needed. Equally important, China also must better understand how its changing status may affect and be perceived by the outside world, especially by the United States. Now with that insightful message from the Chinese artist Ding Yi, on the importance of empathy, I would like to end my uh, prepared remarks. I'm sorry that I go beyond the 20 minutes. And sorry, sorry also for concluding this presentation with a commercial promotion for the book. But as a Shanghainese, I cannot escape, escape the entrepreneurial Shanghai spirit in my blood. Back to you, Clay. With your indulgence, I'd like to tell a coffee story. Uh, I'm inspired by your discussion of the espresso machine and that sort of thing. Uh, it's also a middle-class Shanghai story, but it's rural Shanghai. In 91, 1991, I'm living in rural, uh, rural Shanghai, looking at small town economic and social change. My best friend was a physician and I wanted to thank him. And so I bought him a ridiculous thing, a coffee maker, gave it to him. In 1992, the coffee maker dies. An American, American brand, I don't know where it was made, but American brand coffee maker. He writes to the company, doesn't tell me, writes to the company, and they send him a new coffee maker. That made a huge impression on him. Uh, that sense of corporate brand awareness, corporate responsibility, wanting to serve their customer. Uh, so yeah, coffee is a remarkable, a remarkable part of this story. Uh, a few questions to open. And I know our time is restricted. So I'll try to be short with the questions. And hopefully you can try to compress your answers a bit. I would encourage everybody to get this book. It is incredibly rich. You've just gotten a taste. Uh, the first question goes back to where you began. China is not monolithic. And Shanghai is not monolithic. Uh, this middle class is not monolithic. Why do you think that you know, we talk in terms and that uh, we often refer to China in ways that suggests it's not as big, big, sprawling, diverse as it in fact is? Well, um, first of all, uh, China is too big, and um, uh, to a certain extent that uh, uh, particularly related with current atmosphere. You heard so much about uh, all these negative things about China, uh, which certainly has some truism, um, but um, on the other hand, it's exaggerated because we are, we are in the game, at least uh, some corner want to treat China as enemy. It's not uh, smart to say it's a diversified. There's a lot of dimensions. And uh, certainly there's some tendency, um, unfortunately, we try to demonize uh, the others. So how, uh, so that's actually a very, very unfortunate situation. The same things you can see that when, if the two countries on the confrontation course, Chinese probably will do the same thing by demonize Americans. And so this precisely I wanted to challenge, want to remind people 
um, you know, it's too early, too premature to announce that uh, middle class will be anti-US, will be part of the China, part of the global dominance, which I do not see any, any evidence. So I think at the moment it's a political uh, situation. Uh, early on, I think it's also difficult because the concept of middle class is related with civil society, with democracy, but it's not happening, right? So that also make people to uh, hesitant to use that term, right? So, but the actual business community, uh, they actually the first accept the concept of middle class because these people, you know, um, you know, uh, work like, uh, uh, live like middle class, consume like middle class, feel like middle class. They are middle class. So that's a, it's already transfer the the market, transfer the Chinese class structure. So I think that's the components probably all related to that, uh, that uh, uh, this uh, unfortunate situation. Uh, so I think that to a certain extent, we should do more, far more to bring a real China, its different dimensions, its complexities, its ever-changing nature. Nothing is predetermined. If you think it's a predetermined, we are really heading towards a very, very destructive, you know, uh, confrontation. This precisely we should avoid. Well, and the, one of the key takeaways from your book is the importance of direct contact, direct engagement. And you highlight, for example, uh, you know, return scholars, and you draw on the work of uh, Wang Hui Yao uh, and the Center for China and Globalization, the surveys, these sorts of things. And so you are trying to add nuance to this picture. You are trying to, uh, first of all, decenter de the discussion in certain respects by focusing on Shanghai, yeah. uh, which is not Beijing, yeah. and talking about the diversity within Shanghai. But if I could ask you uh, about those returnees, because this goes to one of the things that you just mentioned about middle class values. What what do people favor? What do they want? What do they hope for? That sort of thing. Um, one of the surveys that you cite in your book notes that almost half of the returnees said that their most troubling thing, the most difficult adjustment they had to make was on values. Maybe you could say something more about that disconnect. Well, certainly foreign study experience uh, uh, have an impact on that. There's no question about that. But uh, that impact is uh, it's a mix. Um, just like uh, we Americans, we also have mixed views of our political system, our leaders, um, our society. So if we have mixed views, why we cannot let, allow other people have mixed views? But for them, uh, these people benefit from both cultures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and also that I want to emphasize that actually contribute to mutual understanding. And also surveys uh, all indicate, including David Zweiger, I mean, a, a good friend of us, uh, he also studied, he found that usually people who study in a particular country, they like that country. So this is also evident in my survey, people like the United States. But again, in the recent events or some incidents make them to have a different uh, uh, thought. But on the other hand, I mean, in terms of environmental protection, you know, um, the property rights, and um, um, in terms of the labor rights, and uh, and uh, etc., and um, they actually influenced by um, their study in this country, right? So I think that um, we do need to see the complexity, the impacts. It's not completely uh, just uh, just uh, one sided or other, but also uh, there's a lot of different variations. So I think the situational factors play an important role. But overall, I'm a big fan of the educational exchange. I myself is a beneficiary for that itself. So I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity that, um, that uh, you know, uh, uh, President Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping you know, uh, opened, or Dr. Kissinger opened uh, China. But I think that uh, we are in a critical juncture. So it's far too early to say that engagement policy failed Actually, Asian Pacific enjoy 50, almost 50 years of peace, as my colleague Jeff Bader uh, constantly emphasized. This is not a failure. 
Uh, that's a great achievement compared with the previous uh, you know, half century. Uh, there's so many wars in that region compared with the US policies in other regions. But now I think we face a real challenge. So I think we should put in that all that in, in the perspective. I think returnees should be a bridge, should contribute to mutual understanding. Uh, but rather, you know, we should not, uh, we should not, you know, uh, 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 decouple, particularly decoupling in the education and culture front. Yeah, and so your actual institute did great, uh, has done great work in the promoter culture exchanges. Some of your program really concentrate on culture and education exchanges. Yeah, we've definitely, uh, you know, sought to do those sorts of things. But uh, you, did, in your comments just now, you raised several other questions. Uh, first of all, the subtitle of your book is about reshaping U.S.-China uh, engagement. And so I want to get to that. Uh, but also, you made mention that you yourself have benefited from education in the United States. And one of the points that you make in the book, though, is that the benefits flow both ways, that, in fact, the United States has benefited from the talent that has come to the United States and stayed, but also that the United States benefits from having more people in China with a more nuanced view of the United States. And so I think that that's a really important contribution here. Well, absolutely. And also it's a, you know, when we started at the education exchange, uh, Deng Xiaoping and both Deng Xiaoping and Jimmy Carter uh, talk about the peace. Um, it's not just the education exchange per se, but uh, for uh, peace and understanding. That was a theme even from the day one when they signed the agreement in 1979. And also for US, we always have the idea to try to foster the future generation of Chinese leaders. To a certain extent, I mean, we also achieved to a certain extent, you look at the, even look at the Power Bureau of the Chinese Communist Party, and um, you look at Liu He, uh, mm -hmm. the vice premier who got his degree from uh, from Harvard Kennedy School and many others. There are more are coming. But uh, of course, it's not just simplistic. These uh, people will be you know, uh, only for the US. No, of course, they, they, they are also Chinese themselves. So, but at least it's much better than the, the, the real hardliner to completely ignore, you know, want to cut off all these exchanges. The Chinese side, you can see, also have such kind of sentiment, right? So I'm worried that uh, they reinforce each other. Uh, well, uh, 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 in that regard, both positive force wanted to cooperate, but also there's a negative force in both countries want to make us, you know, depart. Well, and this is an essential point that, in fact, the hardening line, we can see evidence of it on both sides of the Pacific. Um, you gave us plenty of examples of things that have happened during the Trump administration uh, and some things that have continued today. The anti-Asian, uh, you know, hate speech and this sort of thing. But also we see in China some sign that there's less openness. Uh, yeah. For example, in your book, you, you cite David Zweig as, uh, you know, in, uh, education may be the most international thing in China. Yeah. Uh, but just recently it was announced that, and you cite that there's 600 international high schools, but just recently it was announced that foreign curriculum cannot be used for compulsory subjects in those, uh, in those high schools. Can you say something about the atmosphere of discussion, of, uh, of openness? You cite many scholars who are at great odds with each other about the concept of the middle class and the importance of the middle class. So it seems like there's a lot of space for debate. Well, uh, uh, yeah, the, the example you use also caught my attention. I hope this is temporary. I, I think that probably we're not represent the entire country. And, uh, but if you look at some fields like the international relations, like law, you know, these fields did not exist uh, before 1970s. I remember when I was at uh, college, even in the early 1980s, um, the, the field that is very closest to international relations is called the communist uh, movement. Then added one word called history of communist movement because the Soviet Union collapsed later on, right? Uh, but now it's, you look at the, this is a, talk about realism, you know, and the liberalism, Marxism, look at the level of the analysis. You look at legal profession entirely adopted by 
Western culture, Western educational system. They still are uh, taught there, right? You look at the think tank scholars, you mentioned about the Henry Wang, you look at many others, they also uh, receive education abroad in Canada, United States, et cetera. So really transform China. I think these people already become critical mass. I hope that they will continue to play a positive role and at this critical moment. So, but of course, that, uh, I'm not saying that they have all the problems are caused by the US side. And uh, I, but on the other hand, you see that the education exchange is not a balance. China has, a, for example, has a, you know, 360,000 students in the United States. US only have 20,000 students in China. I think US should really, at the time, we should have better understand China. Decouple or close door is not our approach, right? So, of course, early on, China's NGO law certainly uh, caused a lot of trouble, uh, uh, caused a lot of barriers for foreign NGOs in China. I hope that it uh, should be fixed, but I'm, I'm a little bit worried with this decoupling will reinforce each other. And, uh, you know, so, but I think all these things are not predetermined or fixed, are subject to change. Our leaders, Chinese leaders, should be wise enough to look at the big picture and to avoid this kind of extreme views to isolate, uh, either isolate the other or eventually isolate ourselves or themselves. Now, these are excellent points about the risks of decoupling and you know, the sorts of uh, rhetoric that you know, may lead to it. Uh, our colleague who you made reference to, Stan Rosen, uh, has raised a question. And in fact, you've just addressed part of it. Uh, but what he's saying essentially is that in both countries, in a very polarized in, uh, environment in the United States and a politically uh, complex situation in China, uh, the main audience for politicians is local. It's not global. It's not uh, the other party. You're speaking to people in this particular audience. And this is something that is maybe a little bit more difficult uh, for politicians to grasp, that although their target audience is local, these words travel. Well, um, it's, this is an excellent question. In general, I agree with uh, that observation. But on the other hand, I think uh, neither Republican nor Democrats um, really reach uh, the, the, the consensus even within their party, party, not to mention about the class of the party. There's a different approach, right? And uh, for example, that the Trump, um, particularly his uh, hawkish team already think of China, we should pursue regime change. And uh, we, they adopted this, uh, uh, you know, kind of ban on the, China, uh, the visit of Chinese Communist Party, right? But uh, Biden at least has uh, uh, not go that far. But of course, that um, uh, certainly his emphasis on, on coalition building uh, uh, makes Chinese very critical of him. But it's a different. It's, you see the differences. But it also, of course, if you look at the Republican, the the con those in the Congress, those in local governments, they also differ. You know, you see so many governors, whether Republican or Democrat, wanted to continue engage in the sister programs with China. I mean, they really uh, spent the decades to build up, right? So again, we have every reason uh, to be alert to uh, China's uh, rise and the, chi the uh, uh, possible undermine American interest. But at the same time, I think we should be smart enough to understand that um, the, the you know, decoupling, disengagement, and um, uh, confrontation is not the solution in today's world. This is certainly, because as I said early on, my argument is that no country can defeat the other. And that to use Cold War method, it certainly does not serve American interest. Uh, so I think we should avoid. In that regard, I think we should have a debate. Um, yes, at the moment that they want to cut a deal. I agree with Stanley uh, uh, and Professor Rosen that uh, because they, they said not so many things, they agree with each other. Uh, so it uh, put China on the front line. But on the other hand, I mean, how long they can last? Um, American public opinion is very sophisticated. Um, if you bring everything to China, people do not buy, necessarily buy that. I mean, yes, we should be tough on China, but do we want to have a war with China? You can ask that question. American public will say, for what? 
right? So again, um, sometimes that the, the, uh, the debate is not uh, uh, really uh, reach the general public uh, as it deserves. And even our political leaders, yes, there's some consensus, but there are also widely differences, even within the political establishment. If you look at the Republicans, I mean, people like uh, uh, you know Kissinger, Paulson, Bob Zalek, uh, they are Republicans, but they certainly think engaging with China is important, right? Democrats, yes, some people are also, also very, very tough on China. And uh, there's legitimate reasons, but at the same time, I think that the, um, the, 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 we should uh, really develop a strategy, serve American interests. I think middle-class development, we should uh, race for the top, not to race to the bottom as the, uh, uh, the Tony Blinken said. But unfortunately, I think we are now, the way uh, we just uh, blame to each other, blame each other and condemn each other, this is very, very dangerous uh, 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 to particularly uh, do not make a serious effort to understand each other. So that's the essence that I think that we do need to have a program to discuss more about the different options and the different uh, scenarios. And also, um, uh, uh, you know, it's again, I'm really very cynical about the, 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 the failure of engagement. Of course, you can uh, re revise, change. I think middle class is a way to re-engage China. Um, certainly that the China benefits from our open system our university system, right? And uh, yeah, you can say United States, maybe it's self-serving to open China during the Cold War vis-a-vis -vis Soviet Union at that time. But at the same time, you know, as a person uh, benefit American generosity, I think there's a lot of sincerity. There's, a, uh, I mean, uh, uh, generosity, goodwill. That it's not uh, gone, it's still there, it's still here, right? Same thing, the Chinese, I think when I talk to people, most of people still have uh, admiration for Americans. But when you caught up with these kind of incidents, one after another, people naturally could have second thought. But it's not the predetermined, not the fixed. So we should do well. That's the, the whole uh, you know, competition. If the competition is competition, healthy competition, I mean, we should emphasize not this kind of negative leading towards confrontation, ask people to take a position. That's not the answer. Well, and throughout the U.S.-China, uh, you know, re-engagement, you know, beginning in 1972 with Nixon and running up through Carter and Deng, uh, it has been for mutual benefit. Yeah. Uh, it's true that the United States sought a bulwark against the Soviet Union and that Mao Zedong also wanted the same thing, uh, that it was for strategic reasons. But as you said, uh, hundreds of millions of people have other contact, other experiences, other desires. And to get at that, uh, we have a couple of questions and, and I'd like your, to ask your indulgence for a few more minutes. Uh, one question, uh, it was about the messaging during the Trump administration, which in some cases, in some cases, there was a little bit of nuance where leaders want to distinguish between an attitude towards the Communist Party of China and an attitude towards the people of China. Did that resonate at all with no, middle class Shanghai? No, because... Uh, um the rhetoric is a whole society threat. You do not make a distinction between state and society because society, whole of society threat, right? This is number one. Number two, I mean, you're suspicious of all the students. I mean, they are because their family is still in China. Chinese companies weaponize them to steal intellectual property. This is really not appropriate, but that has, be not being really serious challenge, why? Right? And also you want to ban or restrain the visits of a Chinese Communist Party, 92 million plus their family, 300 million. How do you know their Chinese Communist Party families? Again, I'm not a fan of the Chinese Communist Party. You know, none of my family members are Chinese Communist Party member. Of course, that I still have some relatives in China, but none of them is a Communist Party member. Now, but, uh, but on the other hand, I mean, 
many Chinese Communist uh, Party members, they, they, they dominate the Chinese top universities, students, faculty, and etc. right? So you alienated this, these people for what? And also I would say, when you see 300 million people on the ban list, this is the modern version, 2020 version of a Chinese Exclu Exclusion Act that's really undermine American um, soft power. It's not American. It's immoral. It's illegal, in my view. Why? So, well, that's, the thing, so that's the thing. Do you call this is a distinction between state and, and society? No. Why? And also one of the bizarre things, Sounds like there's a, uh, there's a difference between government and the party, because it, let's face it, it's a party state, right? So you're dealing with the, the, the party state because the most of leaders, majority of leaders are communist party members, right? But again, it's uh, the fear. Now they cause the Chinese are fear. There's mutually uh, fear reinforced each other. It's really downward spiral, um, you know, and uh, uh, so it's, it's a really unfortunate situation. But I, I think that the, uh, the previous administration definitely uh, did not make a good distinction. And uh, current administration realized certain of the problem, but still not really completely fix uh, that things. Now, but of course that way, I think the uh, Biden administration, you know, did not talk about regime change, right? And they still want to resume educational exchanges with China, cultural education exchanges with China, right? And also that uh, um, I think at least I should give credit that uh, there's no longer talk about Chinese virus or, or, or going through. But uh, again, um, some of the other things that make Chinese very, very nervous. So uh, that, um, you know, our, our credibility, our inference is really um, kind of not so effective at the moment. This is things that, worry as a, as a Chinese American. Uh, you have multiple messages and the ones that uh, can endure are of course the most extreme ones. Yes. And that of course, you know, poses all sorts of challenges. Uh, if we could look at middle-class Shanghai uh, and look at what the perception of the United States is, apart from, you know, the last couple of, uh, couple of years, uh, but including certainly the trade war and things like that. Uh, often you read in the Chinese state media and you hear some Chinese leaders say, here's the basic problem. The United States doesn't want a rising China. The United States is looking to use every means at its disposal to hold China back, to contain China, that discussing human rights, Xinjiang, things like this, this is just a hammer to attack China. Uh, looking at the South China Sea, just a hammer to attack China. Now we have tech sanctions and things like this. Does America, in the minds of middle-class Shanghai, can America coexist with a rising China? Because the, the, the Chinese perception you mentioned, I think it's also monolithic. This is Chinese monolithic thinking of America, which is also misleading, right? And people critical China for different reasons. Not all of them are uh, uh, ill will. Uh, some people have good will. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some uh, disappointment, legitimate disappointment. There's some based on the misunderstanding, misinformation. Some probably concern the right things, but not the other things. Some probably, uh, as you said, probably uh, uh, the uncomfortable rise of China. And, uh, um, but I always believe those uh, real hawkish people are not small, are not big, not many, but uh, unfortunately uh, the discourse at the moment um, is uh, dominated by uh, this group. But I, I hope that it will change. So that kind of, uh, that's why I said uh, towards the end, I use the Ding Yi's view to, uh, to really, this is an excellent piece. He really urged his fellow Chinese to think uh, more creatively, you know, with empathy. empathy. Uh, I think it's, this empathy is the things we need uh, in both country. So again, um, there's a conspiracy, um, you know, kind of theory 
uh, certainly at the moment, uh, get a huge market in China. But in reality, I think that um, they should uh, be uh, they should be more careful. For example, that the uh, uh, Biden administration, many uh, leaders, they are critical about the uh, you know uh, 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 systematic racism in the United States, right? Uh, 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 particularly, you know, support the Black Lives Matters, which is certainly is wonderful. But uh, if domestically they share, they hold such a strong value, admitted American has uh, some systematic racism. Do you think they will not? They will be silent. They will be not be critical of what happened in China. Of course, they will. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the best things. What you said, I think, is that each country should take care of their own business first solve their own problems. This is the best way to show that uh, uh, they want to be do the right things for their own people. And uh, in that regard, to develop a middle class in both country, to reduce economic disparity, to expand the middle class, right? And, uh, and, uh, and also along with that, you know, racial justice and uh, uh, the, all the social uh, causes are very, very important. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Biden certainly is right in the domestic policy, but uh, he w- uh, is not well perceived in China because he asked his allies to take a position and some of the reference may not be, uh, maybe it's too blunt. And you still need to engage with China. Uh, probably should show a certain degree of respect, uh, uh, not a respect for authoritarianism, but respect for, in terms of for, for diplomacy for Chinese people. I think that is very important. So uh, this is the way to answer your excellent question about uh, the old conspiracy about American intention. I think that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, when I uh, uh, also spoke a lot of the Chinese audience, I always talk about we should see US not in a monolithic way and to understand uh, United States in a very difficult period, right? And the, but the point is, both countries have strengths. I mean, China faces serious problem in terms of dem- demographic challenges, you know, lack of natural resources. And also you see that one child policy, you know, primary policy now enter the period to, to have, the, have the things will hurt China. But America has so much resources, so have so much talents in terms of high technology and et cetera. But uh, sometimes we just uh, exaggerate the threat. So this kind of mutual reinforce the fear probably is a sticking point at the current situation. So we should not uh, uh, you know, mystify this kind of mutually reinforced fear. It sounds like everything is with evil intention on both sides. You know? um, so uh, we may be too aware, uh, too aware of the real and potential strength of the other. Yes. Uh, by simultane- and simultaneously uh, insufficiently well-informed about the weaknesses, yes. about the challenges, about the problems that the other is confronting, and to find some kind of common ground where we can to address some of those shared challenges. Uh, you know, water is a, is a, a scarce resource uh, here in California. It's a scarce resource in China. Uh, Clean air is a real problem, these sorts of things. So there's much that we should find ways to engage, find ways uh, to collaborate. And your book highlights this. A final question, and this comes, uh, it's a combination of questions from the audience. One is, who does the government trust? Who does the Chinese government trust? Does the Chinese government trust this middle class? Does the Chinese government trust uh, returnees? You are at some pains to discuss the question of the middle class as a revolutionary or a status quo force. What does the government think? Well, my book also argue not only China is not a monolithic group, not only Chinese culture or Chinese society is not monolithic, actually Chinese leadership is not monolithic either. There are different leaders. Some people more trust the returnees than others. And, uh, but of course, there's always a degree. And also there's also circumstances. But the point is that my uh, chapter on Shanghai, you see a lot of them, 
Right. Um, Shanghai is certainly is the most westernized city and the center of 40, I mean, uh, 25% of the Chinese actually live in Shanghai. Right. That's a huge number, right? And some of them become leaders, There's visiting scholars or degree candidate and et cetera, right? And some of the rising stars in the next generation, actually, uh, they got their degree, they spend the 10 years overseas, you know? Uh, so uh, these people actually continue to move up, but you can also see that some people are probably very critical of these people. Uh, so it's a, it's a, I, I cannot just uh, give a general a statement of who you really trust. And, uh, and the, but I, I, do, I, I do believe that we should not be too ideological to see Chinese leader. These people, they also know they have to adjust to the ever-changing environment. If you continue to call Li Wenliang, um, you know, in such a bad treatment, they will, they will go after them. So therefore, they change the verdict on Li Wenliang, right? So um, this is an ever-changing situation. Um, it's not over yet. And also social media plays such an important role. Uh, it can change the dynamics, right? And also um, now US, both the US and China, um, their economy is relatively okay, I believe. But maybe US is the stock market bubble, China is the probably property bubble, but uh, they probably there's still room to go, you know, to uh, you know, not let it uh, to happen completely. But if it happened, there's also a big if, right? So it's more important, I think, again, this is go back to the early point. The leader should constantly to uh, look at what's going on, how people uh, think, how, they, how their policy affects them. So they should be careful not to go extreme. That any kind of anti-foreign xenophobic or xenophobia for the US May not may eventually hurt ourselves, hurt politicians themselves. So this is why I think it's far too early to say there's a consensus, there's a strategy. Probably there's an attitude, but attitude can change. Mm -hmm. Chinese side, same thing. I think some of the rhetoric is really too much. Uh, they should they should review. And uh, 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 China greatly benefit from the kind of exchanges. Uh, China's soft power still quite weak, right? And um, I think that uh, uh, if you have that kind of attitude, uh, so I think that the Chinese leaders uh, will make some of the adjustment. Um, so the important thing is, again, even the Chinese leadership is not monolithic. I mean, the, look at the history, there's some liberals, Zhao Ziyang, Fu Yaobang, right? And there's some conservatives. And um, again, it's also, uh, you know, the, your leadership, you really should uh, uh, deliver uh, but at the same time, uh, you cannot uh, take for granted, you know, everything will, will continue, right? Uh, they need to adjust the change, the change environment, change domestic and international. Well, I think you've just made uh, in your last answer, but in this book, and in fact, throughout your career, you've made a powerful argument that we need to know more, that both sides need to know more. Uh, that we need to expose ourselves to a greater variety of people, of places, to get a sense of that. Uh, several hundred thousand Chinese studying in the United States uh, at present, including thousands at the University of Southern California. This is a great thing. I hope that uh, we're never going to send hundreds of thousands of students to China, but I hope that we could send more students to China yeah. and that some of those students will also rise up to leadership positions in government. Uh, that would very much help. So I want to say thank you for this book. I want to thank our audience for being with us. I hope that the audience will take advantage of the opportunity they have to get this book and to learn a lot about Shanghai, about uh, this middle class, the place of the middle class. There's a discussion of soft power. There's all sorts of things that we didn't have time to touch on, including the big idea, uh, the contrast between globalization and cultural transnationalism. You argue for uh, you know, the basic idea that 
I can be Chinese and know about the United States. I don't surrender any part of my Chineseness in that. And that could be true for Americans as well. And so I think it's a terrific book. And I just want to say thank you for all the time, energy, the work that went into it and for sharing with us today. We really appreciate it. And we hope we have you back very, very soon. Thank you.